praise the beauty of your name. Remember, you are our God. You've got every detail well in mind, even ones that we have even begun to consider. We pray, Lord, that as we hear your word, that we hear your voice, and that you speak to us by your spirit. We pray, Lord, that we have opened ourselves up to receive all your goodness. We ask, Lord, that you would bless the speaking today and the listening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. So continue with 126. Love the vine, all loves excel.
uh, Wednesday's Bible study and prayer meeting at 7 p.m. at the home of the elders. Uh, August 5th is a council meeting at 7 p.m. Uh, that will also be back here in the church, in the back of the church. August 11th, uh, church picnic we talked about a second ago. Uh, August 17th is a library cleanup day. So please see Dawn. There will be plenty of work to, to do that because the uh, been neglected for a little bit, so please do not help with that. Um, let's see. Oh, the picnic, did you ask about tents? If you have another pop up tent or two, we could probably use them. Yeah, if you, you have, have one. If you have any sort of shade that you can bring with you. Or spare maple tree. If you want yeah. to play with that that's fine. <laughs> yeah, um, the sun may be a little bit of an issue, so uh, bring your pop up or. or uh, yeah, last year we had some heavy pruning. Yeah. <laughs> so um, let's see what else here. Oh, we ask you to continue to pray at 7 a.m. each day. Pray for God to provide a pastor for us. Um, we pray that you or ask that you pray that uh, the seeds that pl were planted at BBS that uh, they would continue to grow um, there, and uh, God would work on the hearts of those that heard the gospel there. Um, my mom's brother, uh, Rodney, passed away. I announced last week they had his um, celebration of life yesterday. Um, so uh, we thank you for the prayers for the family and all that sort of thing. Please continue to pray for them. Um, Tiffany Robinson, Pastor Matt's wife. Uh, Tiffany will have a CT scan tomorrow. Um, she's completed 12 treatments so far, and the plan was to reevaluate things at this time. But they moved her scan sooner because she's been experiencing some symptoms. So we just ask that you pray for Tiffany. Um, she's had some concerning, concerning symptoms like being winded upon exertion and her oxygen levels dropping. Um, and also some potential concern with some of her blood work. Um, the scan results are scheduled to be discussed on Tuesday. So just be in prayer for Tiffany and Pastor Matt and the kids. Um, and that everything works out well there and for healing for her. Uh, Miss Jackie's recovering from a knee replacement. I haven't heard too much about that as far as a, a report. Um, I talked to him before and, and she was recovering. Um, you know, like you would expect. You know, just takes a little bit to recover, but I haven't had any other reports since then. And of course, continue to pray for Pastor Sam's uh, voice. Um, pray that you would, uh, or ask that you would pray to be with, um, that God would be with Eric. Um, of course, back on seizure medication, can't drive for three months. Um, that would be, you know, that's a problem, of course. Um, so, um, pray for Eric and his family. And uh, Paul had mentioned his uncle Kurt, his mom's brother. Uh, Lymphoma may be returning. Pray for him. And uh, Pastor Steve and Alan Wall, as they recover, and Pastor Steve will have to have another have to have another surgery. So be in prayer for that. And uh, I don't have any other um, any other updates or anything to go over. Did anybody have any other announcements or prayers? This time we'll have a special meeting.
James chapter 1. You'll have to forgive me if I clear my throat or if I'm sniffling a lot. My allergies have not been cooperating with me this morning. In James chapter 1, I'm actually uh, going to be starting a series in the book of James. Spend a little bit of time here. Why James? Although I didn't just pick a book and say I'm going to preach through this one. This book, first of all, has been very important to me in my life. I've been studying it for a long time, and it really has shaped much of the way I think, much of the way I act. It's been very important for me, just getting through different parts of my life. And so it's personal. I spent a lot of time meditating here. And I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned and some of the things that have been helpful to me in my life. So I haven't just picked a book and said, okay, I'm going to preach to this. I picked a book that I'm familiar with and a book that I think we could all, that it would be good if we were all familiar with it. I want to share with you some of the truths that I've learned in my life. The second reason for why Jane would be, it's very practical. A lot of the books in the New Testament, especially the ones written by Paul, are very theological, very philosophical, and sometimes they're very difficult to read through. Some difficult concepts, sometimes it seems like Paul's saying one thing and then in another passage he says the opposite, and you're, you're trying to reconcile it, and at the end of it, it feels like it was a lot of an intellectual exercise. And there is practical application though, but James is just practical for the most part. There's a lot of practical, here is, here is how being a Christian looks in an everyday life. Remember uh, with my last two messages, both I, I made reference to having a genuine everyday walk. Well, what does that look like? James is going to make that very clear. James makes it very clear what the practical everyday Christian walk looks like. Uh, it's not just um, certain, a certain set of things you have to believe. He's going to show us what faith really is. It's not just something that you think or something that you believe. Faith is something that you do and live out every single day. And he shows us exactly how to do that. Which is the third reason. James explains what it means to have faith. We hear the phrase going around a lot, have faith. We know from Hebrews that without faith it is impossible to please God. Well, Fortunately, James gives us an entire letter describing what it means to have faith and therefore be able to please God. But then the fourth reason I want to spend some time in this book is because it is probably one of the most misunderstood books for all the practical wisdom, for all the practical life, uh, Christian life tips that it has. It is very often taken very out of context. And a lot of people think that... Um, it outright contradicts Paul. Uh, that Paul said you are saved by grace through faith, you are justified under faith, not under the works of the law. And then James comes over here and seems to, seems to say the exact opposite with verses like, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, uh, he, he who hears the word and does it not, is like a man looking in the mirror not doing it about it, versus like, um, what is the prophet if a man hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Versus like, um, if you if you keep the whole, whosoever keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Versus like, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. These things seem to contradict what Paul says about salvation being by faith alone. And then James comes along and says, faith without works is dead. So. It's important for these reasons that we spend some time here. It's important that we understand what James has to say. Because if we understand James, the whole book, we understand the context of those verses that are ripped out of their context, then we know what those verses are really trying to say and why they're really there in that passage. And we'll find that they don't actually contradict Paul at all. They provide a synergy. And Paul, had, Paul and James had to address two extreme views. Paul had to, had to address the view of the Jews who thought that they were saved by keeping the law. And James had to address the people who had taken Paul's teachings too far to think that they could 
just, oh, well, I don't have to be a Christian now. I can just one day when I get to heaven tell God, oh, yeah, I had faith during my life. It doesn't work that way. And so they, they actually go together very well. Um, before I get into, day, into today's message, since I'm going to be doing a series in James, since I'm going to be spending some time here, I think it's important to us that we uh, first introduce the book and get to know what's going on in this book. Who wrote it, who it was written to, when it was written, why it was written. As to who wrote it, there's really only, there, there's really only two possibilities. Um, at this point, James, the brother of John, son of Zebedee, had already been martyred. It, it's very unlikely that he wrote this book. He had already been executed by Herod. Um, and James was written, the book of James was written very early, but not that early. Um, most scholars would agree that it was written around AD 46, whereas James, the son of Zebedee, would have been killed a lot sooner than that. So there's only two options left. James, the son of Alphaeus, and James, the Lord's brother. The history points, and especially stories such as Josephus, Eusebius, the early church father Clement, they point to a man named James the Just. Um, and this James the Just, they acknowledge he was, the, he was the leader of the church of Jerusalem. They acknowledge that he was martyred by the Jews um, near the time of the destruction of the temple, just before it actually. And Eusebius points to this James as the one who wrote this book. And while that James just is still, you're, we're still wondering if that's the son of Alphaeus or the Lord's brother, Eusebius and Clement and Josephus, all three in harmony tell us, these, these ancient historians tell us that James the Just was also referred to as the Lord's brother. And uh, this would have been the one mentioned in Matthew 13 and Mark 6, when Jesus' brothers were listed as being the sons of Mary. You had uh, James, Joseph, um, Judas, and Simon. And also the one mentioned in Galatians 1 as the Lord's brother. So probably this is written by the one who, according to John 7, had at one point actually not believed in Jesus' message. He had not been a believer up to, the, up to uh, the point that Jesus appeared to him after his resurrection. James and his brothers, along with Jude, um, they rejected him. They didn't believe him. And so it's this James who later, after having been converted, after seeing the resurrected Jesus, is now writing this letter. History tells us that he was a very religious man. He was very devoted to Christ and he was very Jewish. After being converted, he still followed the law. He still followed all the traditions of his people to the point that even up to his martyrdom, most of Israel still recognized him as the righteous. And they still looked to him as a very wise man. He prayed for uh, his people every single day that they, they would be forgiven for their rejection of the Messiah. So who's it written to? Well, verse 1 says, James, the servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. The twelve tribes scattered abroad, literally, the twelve tribes of the dispersion, is, is what the Greek conveys. It's, it's an actual event, the dispersion. First of all, we shouldn't think that this letter is just for the Jews. And he says here that it's for the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. He would not have been excluding Gentiles, because at this point in the early church, there were not very many Gentiles in the church. It was mostly Jews at this point. So this book is for the church. But the Jews that were scattered abroad weren't just all Jews who had converted. There were those Jews who were known as Hellenists. They, had, they were Jews who had accepted the Greek way of life and they had adopted that lifestyle. And the Jews already didn't like them. They felt as though they had betrayed the tradition. So when these Hellenist Jews converted to Christianity, they began to persecute them. They said, we, we see no reason to keep you around. You worship this false prophet. You've accepted the ways of the Greeks. And so they started to persecute them. 
The Jewish Christians at that point, the ones who did not follow the Greek lifestyle, hadn't been persecuted yet. Uh, Christianity wasn't seen as its own religion. It was seen as a sect within Judaism. And so some of the Jews have been scattered, while other Jews, like James himself, are still in Jerusalem. James is not facing persecution yet at this point. Neither are the apostles. They are all still in Jerusalem. But these Hellenistic Jews who have converted, they have been persecuted. They have been scattered. And so this letter is for them. But it's also for the church at large, because again, they were the church at that point. There were very few Gentiles who, there were very few Gentile converts at that point. So to keep all this in mind, J James has been referred to as the most Jewish book of the New Testament. Um, there's lots of focus on works, there's lots of focus on tradition, there's lots of focus on not just saying you believe something, there's, there's, there's focus on living that belief out. And so as we keep all of these things in mind, we can start to move into studying it. We can, we can think about who it is that's talking, who it is he's talking to, and why the letter is being sent. They've been dispersed. They're being persecuted. And that goes right along with the very first message that I have today on temptation. So I'll read the text passage for today. We're looking at James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. But the whole minded man is unstable in all his ways. The call to rejoice in temptation is not an easy one to answer. When we think of temptation, we might think incorrectly of enticing. We might think wrongly of someone who is trying to get us to do wrong. Something is put in front of us that is designed to trip us up that is designed to make us do what is wrong, and that is not the temptation that is in view here. The Greek word is uh, perasmos, and the idea behind it is testing. The idea behind it is proving something's value. Um, 1 Peter 1, verse 7 says, The trial of your faith being more precious than of gold that perisheth. The verse before talks about manifold temptation, connecting these ideas of temptation and trial. There's a testing going on here. There's a trial. There's a tribulation. But it is not designed to hurt you. It is not designed to trip you up. This is something that is designed to try your faith. That is something that is designed he compares in 1 Peter to the process of gold being tried. Gold is being purified. It's not it's not that we're being enticed to do evil and temptation. That is not the kind of temptation we're told to rejoice in. That definition is included, but the primary sense of the word is to test or to prove. Uh, the, the word for temptation in English and the word in Greek have the same primary and secondary meaning, but flipped. In Greek, the primary idea is testing, and that can include being tempted to do wrong, being tempted to take something that you want. Whereas in English, it kind of tends to go the other way around. We think of temptation as being this evil thing. But it can also just have the meaning of trial. So they're, they're kind of flipped. So when we read James, make sure that when you read temptation, you understand it in the light of the former. That it's first a testing, and that can include an enticing to do wrong. But we're talking about trials. We're talking about tribulations, persecutions, adversities, struggles, things we deal with in our life. Maybe our car breaks down. Maybe a friend passes away. Maybe we lose our job or our wealth or something. 
it creates a period of time that is uncomfortable. A period of time where we have no choice but to trust God. The response to temptation here in verse 2, he says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. The response to temptation is that we're to rejoice. We're supposed to be happy when we go through those things that I just listed. We're supposed to take whatever that thing is, the car breaking down, the friend passing away, losing all we have, whatever. We're supposed to take that and we're supposed to somehow rejoice. We're supposed to somehow be happy. That doesn't come naturally. It is a very difficult thing to do. We can look to examples like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. When he has a thorn in the flesh, he asks three times for God to remove it. And God says, my grace is sufficient for you. And uh, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He says, those things that I count as weaknesses, I glory in those. I'm proud of my weaknesses, because in those weaknesses, God can show how strong and great he truly is. So Paul understood it. Paul got it. But we're also not Paul. And so that's why we need James to come along and tell us how we can rejoice in these temptations. How we can rejoice in those trials. So we have the response to temptation. Secondly, we have the reason for temptation. If we want to understand how it is that we're supposed to rejoice, there's some things we have to know. There's some things we have to understand if we're going to be able to rejoice in these temptations. Verse 3 says, Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. It builds our character. It builds our patience. It builds our endurance. Um... The, the word here has the idea of remaining under something that we don't want to be under. But, but we, do it with, we do it in such a way that we're, we're not trying to get out of it. We're trying to get through it. Other words that we can think of when we look at the word patience are endurance, perseverance, tenacity. Essentially, our trials are designed to make us better at enduring trials. They make us better sufferers and therefore more like Christ. He goes on in verse 4 to say, Let pagans have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Again, our, our reading of this passage will be tainted by how English words work. In our minds, perfect means without flaw. We think of only God as being perfect. But he says here that these trials are designed to make us perfect and entire. And the idea behind, whenever you see the word perfect in the Bible, almost every single time, it doesn't have to do with being sinless. It doesn't have to do with being flawless. It has to do with being complete. It has to do with being whole. It has to be, do with being consistent, thoroughly holy, thoroughly Christian. Yeah, we'll still sin. We'll still mess up. But the, that's not the idea behind the word perfect here. If we want to look at a word that means sinless and without flaw, we look at a word like righteous or holy. But the word here is perfect, complete, whole, entire. And when, we put, when he puts these two words together, um, when, when Hebrews would say the same word, or very nearly the same thing twice in a row, it served to, to really show you how complete that idea was. So he's using the word complete itself here, basically twice around. He's saying you're complete and entire, all throughout, a wholly consistent person. One who is the same no matter who is, no matter his environment, no matter his context, no matter who he's around, he is the same. He is consistent. He is perfect. He's entire. And these are, the, these are the things that a trial, a temptation that God has brought into our life, help us with. They help us with things like patience, long-suffering, endurance, 
being a whole and entire consistent person who is the same regardless of context. But even knowing the reason, even knowing what temptation is for, even knowing why God allows us to go through the things he allows us to go through, it's still very difficult for us to see temptation in a positive light. It's still very difficult for us to rejoice. Which is why we need wisdom. These verses flow one right into the next. Really, it's answering any objection that you might have. He says, uh, count all joy you fall temptations. What? Temptations aren't joyful things. Okay, well, this is why you go through temptations. You, you, they build your character, they build your patience, they build um, your consistency. Okay, well, I don't have the wisdom to see it that way. That's not how my mind works. It's hard for me to go through a trial with that mindset. Okay. So we have the response to temptation, the reason for temptation. Thirdly, we have the offer of wisdom. He says, if you can't see your temptations that way, if you struggle to see temptation in the light that I'm putting to you, and therefore you struggle to rejoice in temptation, if you lack wisdom, if any of you lack wisdom, let ask of God and give it to all men liberally without restraint, and upbraideth not. The idea here is he's not chastising us. He's not criticizing us. He's not condescending. He's not looking at us and saying, what do you need more wisdom for? He gives it liberally. He doesn't criticize. But there's a catch. See, we need, we need the wisdom, and I'm moving through my points very quickly here. I kind of knew I would. But we need the wisdom. We, we don't naturally see our temptation. We don't naturally see our problems in life this way. And so if we, if we don't have the wisdom, if we're struggling with that, we just ask God. He gives it without restraint, and He gives it without criticizing. But there is a catch which leads to my fourth point. When we ask, we must ask in genuine faith. This doesn't mean if we believe hard enough. Um, I, I, I get this picture of someone just really thinking and squinting and, and, and trying to really believe it hard enough, and then eventually, oh, it, it works, it happened. I believed hard enough, and so God gave me the wisdom. God gave me what I need to get through this trial and tribulation. That is not what this means. It does not mean if you really, truly believe it. Now, that, that is essentially what it means. There, there are two ideas that go together. But it's not saying you can will something into existence because you believe that God would really do it. When he says that you must ask in faith, nothing wavering, it's talking about the person asking himself, not whether or not he believes, because whether or not he believes will be evident. Whether or not he believes will show. Well, we're going to spend more time exploring the idea of faith in the messages to come and what it really means to have faith. In fact, that is one of the main themes of the book of James is what it looks like to have a genuine faith. But asking in faith implies a whole lifestyle. Remember a few verses back, it talks about the trying of your faith. The idea of wavering and of doubting, the, the idea of wavering and doubting are closely related. A person who doubts will waver in the way he lives. He won't be consistent. He won't. It's what, I, it's what I've talked about in both of my past sermons. It's a, it's a person who, in front of one group of people, he's a Christian, and then in front of another group of people, he's whatever they want him to be. And, and, and who he is is determined by what the people around him want him to be. A person who wavers in the way he lives will begin to doubt. A person who claims to be a Christian 
who is living two separate lives or more is going to lose track of which of those lives he really is. He's going to begin to doubt. He's going to lose faith. And that kind of person's prayer is not answered because he's not asking in faith. If he really truly had faith, he would be showing it. A double-minded man is unstable in all those ways. With the, with the wavering, with the wind of the, the um, he that uh, wavers is as a wind, uh, wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. We almost get a picture of Peter as he's trying to walk on the water. And as these waves are going up and down, and he starts to take his eyes off Jesus and look at those waves, he begins to realize that what he's standing on isn't something that, you, that, that that's, even if it is an actual surface for him to stand on, it's moving. And it's moving a lot. And, and he begins to sink because he takes his eyes off Jesus. And that's what we have here. A person who wavers is like Peter taking his eyes off Jesus. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Go, go, go back to verse. He says, um, let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. But then he says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The man we're talking about, the one who is wavering, is like this one who is um, wavering. He's unstable in all his ways. The word double-minded, James is actually the only person in the New Testament to use it. And in the Greek language, he's the first person to use it. Um, but he takes two words and combines them. The idea here is someone with two souls. Like I said, someone living two lives. This person who is two separate persons. Or at least that's what it would seem if you saw him in different contexts. It seems as though he's two different people. I want you to picture someone who's standing over a chasm, one foot on each side, during an earthquake. I want you to picture someone who's trying to stand on the roof of two separate cars, one foot on each, as they're driving down the highway. Or someone stand, trying to stand in a fishing boat in the middle of a storm, trying, to keep, trying desperately to keep his balance. He can't. And that is the life of a person who tries to have it both ways, who tries to have two sets of principles at once. The set of principles that he uses around his holy friends, and the set of principles he uses at work, or around his family or around his other friends. And eventually, those cars start driving different directions. Eventually, that chasm splits wide open. And he cannot sustain himself. He has to pick one or the other or fall in the middle. Which isn't good. So what we have Really, kind of in conclusion to this whole idea, is that temptation is something we must rejoice in because it makes us more able to endure temptation and makes us more consistent people. But viewing temptation in this light requires wisdom. To get wisdom, we must ask, uh, ask God who will give us wisdom if we ask from a position of genuine faith which is characterized by patience and consistency, the very thing the temptations are meant to build in us. In other words, we need temptations. We need these trials. We need these tribulations because they make us more like Christ. You say, well, the very thing that needs to get through those tribulations are the things that the tribulations are supposed to build. So how do I get through the tribulation? We pray. Well, God won't answer that prayer if I don't have those traits. It's brutal. But these, the, if, we, if we understand how the cycle works, temptation builds these traits that we need to have in order for God to hear us. So that we can ask for wisdom to get through those same temptations. And every time we go through the cycle, we come out looking more and more like Christ. For about a year now, 
I have been struggling with very bad sciatica. Uh, specifically, I have a, a pinched, a compressed nerve in my lower spine on the left side that it was bad. Um, You know, I, I, I was 26 years old when the whole thing started. I wake up one morning, my leg hurts, I don't know why. I brush it off. I've, been, I've woken up sore before, it's probably not a big deal. As the weeks go by, I begin to look into it to figure out what's wrong with me. And when I understand what it is and what it does and how for some people it never goes away, I started to lose hope that mine never would go away. And it kept getting worse. I'm, 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 I'm much better than I was at the point. It was at its worst around last Christmas, the months leading up to Christmas. But it was common for me to wake up and not be able to get out of bed. I couldn't move. I couldn't walk. I couldn't go upstairs. I couldn't do anything. Uh, when I was teaching, I used up all of my paid days off, and eventually I started having to take days off without pay, to the point where administration was starting to wonder if I was even still fit to be there because of the number of days I had to miss. And every time I thought it was getting better, it would get worse. And I just kept thinking, I'm 26, why is this happening to me now? I, I, I was in somewhat good shape. I was energetic, I like doing things, I like hiking, I like snowboarding in the winter, I didn't get to do that this year. And it got so bad. I was mad at God. There were nights that I would scream in my head, if no one was around, I would scream out loud. I would, I, I would yell, hit God and say, why is this happening to me? Why do I have to be in so much pain this early in my life where I can't even get out of bed? It has gotten better. I can walk now. I've been going on hikes again. It's still there. Some days I still wake up in pain, but... You know, sometimes I have to have to pray this much. Since having sciatica, I have a lot more patience than I used to. I used to have no patience at all. This passage is personal because I've seen it work. Because we go into it without the things we need. And when we pray, we feel like we're not being heard because we don't have the things that trial is building in us. But over time, eventually I decided to just go on with my life in spite of the pain. If God wanted to make it worse, he would make it worse. If God wanted to make it better, he would make it better. And that's his choice. That's up to him. And I decided that I just had to be okay with that. But the trying of our faith works patience. We have these things for a reason. And my, my trial, my particular trial, was physical pain. Some of you are probably going through some, some kind of emotional pain. I don't, I don't know what everyone's situation is in here. And sometimes emotional pain can be far worse. But if it's any comfort to you, it's any encouragement to you, at least in my physical trial, I saw exactly how this passage plays out. Some people, the trial happens to show everyone around them how strong they really are. Sometimes the trial happens because that person does not have what they need. And that trial is designed to build up those things because they lack them. The call to rejoice in temptation is not 
an easy one to answer. But with God's wisdom, we can rejoice knowing that it is make, uh, making our faith in Him stronger, knowing that it is making us more like Christ. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the book of James and the lessons that it teaches us. I ask that you would help us to embrace these tribulations that you bring into our life for reasons that we don't know. But we know that you do have reasons. We do know that at the very least, you bring them into our lives to make us better, to make us better Christians, to make us better people, to make us more like your son. I ask that you would help us take these words to heart, help us to live in light of them. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen.
and encapsulates all of that, and your purpose always fulfilled. Even as we started with you build up Jerusalem, your plan through the ages will be fulfilled. Give us the wisdom as freely as you said you would. Help us to have the patience and character building that we need so desperately. And thank you, Lord, for the trials that will prove how much you care about us, that you want us to be at the really top of our game and seeing you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>